Good evening and welcome to Curious About Our Planet, brought to you by the Glasgow Science Centre. My name is Veronica. I'll be your host for this session, Ocean Panels Discussion. We have four scientists for you this evening from our Blue Action Project. The Blue Action Project is a major European investigator, investigatory um, project, and it's all about um, sort of investigating the effect of the changing Arctic and how that affects climate change. Um, what we're going to be discussing tonight is why we are observing the oceans and the Arctic and wanting to predict climate and, of course, how we are observing, monitoring and measuring the oceans and the Arctic and how we use that information um, and pop it into, um, for example, um, projection software to predict climate change and weather. Now, in a moment, I'm going to be playing a presentation for you by the wonderful Dr. Hannah Grist, and she's going to explain a little bit more about Blue Action. After that video, I'll bring you back here and introduce you to our four wonderful scientists, and they will then be live answering all of your questions. Now, during um, our wonderful video, our introductions, you can pop your questions in our comment section. Ask any question you like, however easy or tricky you might think it might be, um, pop those questions and we'll answer them for you. But for now, please enjoy Hannah in our wonderful presentation. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Hannah and I was uh, officially the Knowledge Exchange and Communications Manager. So my job was very much about talking about science to people that needed to understand what the science was about. Um, I used to work in a place called the Scottish Association for Marine Science, which is based near Oban, uh, here in this picture. So you can see on the peninsula the buildings in an amazing setting on the west coast of Scotland. So maybe some of you visited there um, and if you do you know that we call it SAMS for short and it really is an amazing place because we can look at all kinds of marine science anything from understanding whales and dolphins and how they move to ocean currents now within SAMS one of the projects we did was called blue action i'm not sure if anyone recognizes this picture a couple of years ago this was all over social media as an example of climate change and particularly ice melt within the arctic now, this photo was actually taken by the coordinator of Blue Action, Stefan Olsen, based in, in the Danish Meteorological Institute over in Denmark, on a fieldwork trip to Greenland. So he and some colleagues normally go out there every year. They travel by dog sled across the ice to try and retrieve scientific equipment. They leave to monitor ice melt. As you can see this year, the ice melt got a bit ahead of them and it felt like the dogs were walking on water far more than ice. So this really resonated with people because I'm sure you, like everyone else, knows that the Arctic seemed to be in big trouble. Uh, in fact, it's warming at least twice as fast as the rest of the world. Maybe you've seen these news stories about record temperatures and how we might lose all the Arctic ice in the next few decades. So as scientists, for us, studying the Arctic is really important, particularly as it helps us understand what we're facing with climate change and what we might see in the rest of the world. So that's the kind of thing we're doing within Blue Action. Basically, it's a, a really big European research project investigating the Arctic and the effect it has on the rest of the world. And I'd like to introduce you to some of the Blue Action team. We have over 120 scientists in 17 different countries, mainly across Europe, but all across the world, uh, working on this project. And we need this many people, this many scientists, because we're trying to answer some really big questions about climate change. So you can think of what we do uh, a little bit like this. We know that the Arctic is warming really fast. So part of what we need to know is try and understand why that is. What are the causes of this super fast warming? And the second part of that question is looking at what effects this warming has in the Arctic. This isn't what we do as much, but a lot of other projects are also looking at what effects that has on the wildlife, what effects that has on the people that live in the Arctic and dealing with these dramatic changes. And finally, we're looking at what the impact of those changes is for other places like us here in Scotland. Now, you may think that the Arctic is really far away, 
uh, and what happens to us maybe doesn't have much of an impact when you're living in Edinburgh or Thurso. But of course, our entire planet is really interconnected, particularly through our atmosphere and our oceans. I think of oceans as like the blood flowing around your body, moving warmth and gases to different parts that need it. So when the ocean warms, we can actually feel the knock on effects throughout the whole world. Now, perhaps most importantly, uh, if we can understand all these three things, the causes of the changes, the effects of the changes in the Arctic, and then the impact on the rest of the world, we can start to predict what's going to come in the future for all of us and use those predictions to be able to adapt to the changes as best we can. So it's a big question. Um, how do we even start to unravel all these complicated connections? Now, one of the first things we do within projects like this is just observe what's going on, particularly in our oceans. So we can measure lots of aspects of our oceans from the temperature at the different depths to salinity to the flow of ocean currents. But it takes huge collaborations. So not just blue action, but thousands of scientists from all countries and organizations doing these observations and sharing data between us. And the equipment we use is absolutely amazing from underwater robots and gliders to strings of scientific instruments across the sea. Um, and you'll be hearing a little bit more from B about that on our panel. And the second part of what we do is to turn all those observations into replicas of our planet. So we put them all within computers, all the processes that happen, and try to create an understanding of what the world looks like just using a computer. And that's an amazing tool because you then can run the computer forward to understand what's going to happen in the future, or you can make changes to the model and see what effect it has on what the future is going to look like. So that's how we make predictions. And the kind of things you see in the IPCC reports happening way, way into the future, or even just fast forward in these models 10 or 50 or 100 years into the future. One of our scientists like to say it's a bit like getting to be a god because you can watch the planet change just by pushing a button. And finally, we use these predictions to understand the future, to understand the interconnections, and more importantly, to understand what it's going to look like and what we can do about it. So, for example, by observing the Arctic Ocean and putting those observations into a specific model, we found out that a warming Arctic means actually we get more rain in Scotland. We can trace that link from a flood in Fife back to melting ice in the Arctic. If you want to know more about that, uh, the author of that study, Marilena, will be on the panel talking about that as well. So I think that's enough introduction from me right now. Uh, I'm super excited to hear from our panel. We'll be talking about questions you have about oceans and climate change science. Um, and I really hope that a lot of people engage with what we have to say today. Thank you. Thank you so much to Hannah for preparing that for us because it gives us a much better understanding of exactly what we're going to be talking about today with our panel. Um, so now it is time to introduce our wonderful panel of scientists and they'll introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about themselves as well. So the very first scientist I would like to welcome to our wonderful screen is Dr. B. Burks. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> what a wonderful video. If you would like to introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, so my name's B Burks. I also was involved with the Blue Action Project. It's just coming to the end. And I work at Marine Scotland um, in their science division. So I'm a researcher for the Scottish Government. And I study the ocean circulation around Scotland and I can make observations. And then more recently, I also have a role um, advising on climate change um, for government, especially the marine environment. Oh, wow. Very impressive. Sounded very busy as well, definitely. It is busy. Well, thank you. Yes. <laughs> So we'll get on to our very next wonderful scientist. It's Dr. Madalena Altman. Welcome, Madalena. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Marilena Altman. So I um, I started um, doing research on ice ocean atmosphere interactions when um, when I was a PhD student in the US. And then I did a postdoc in Germany. And now I'm in the UK in Southampton. And I, I work on specifically the subpolar North Atlantic region and um, look at how the atmosphere affects the ocean and then the ocean um, responds and influences the atmosphere again and then the atmosphere feeds back again influencing the ocean and that leads to a lot of complex and very interesting um, feedback processes that ultimately make up our weather and our climate. 
that sounds really interesting a lot of back and forth there it gets very very complicated yeah and also then the ice um interacts because when we have more melting ice that influences the ocean and that feeds back on the atmosphere and that leads to even more ice melting so there are a lot of um, a lot of feedbacks that makes it really interesting to study it that does sound really, really interesting. I'm hoping we get more into that during our panel as well. Um, and last but not definitely not least, Dr. Jonathan Tinker, welcome to our wonderful screen. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tinker. I'm a climate marine climate scientist at the Met Office. Um, I study the seas around the UK, so the North Sea, the Irish Sea, the Celtic Sea, um, the present day climate and the future climate. And I use sort of high resolution regional models driven by global climate models to make these climate projections. Sounds really interesting as well. All <laughs> of your introductions are so impressive. I'm really looking forward to just getting stuck in with our questions. So I'm not even going to delay. Let's just get stuck right in, shall we? Very first question, why is the Arctic warming and what are the main causes? Oh, Jonathan. Um, so the entire planet is warming through um, anthropogenic greenhouse gases uh, warming up the planet. Um, but the Arctic is warming much faster than the global mean, sort of two to three times, uh, twice as fast on average. Um, and that's partly, well, largely because of the uh, feedbacks within the Arctic. So the Arctic is generally very white, so most of the light is reflected off it. But as it warms the the sea ice melts and so it absorbs more temperature and that's one of the leading leading factors right so it's that sort of feedback kind of loop that's making it warmer and warmer yeah. would that be a correct assessment yeah and then there are also additional feedbacks like the ocean and atmosphere transport even more heat to the atmosphere that's what we have seen in the recent period but we don't know if this will this feedback will continue it, it was specific um over the last years and um, there are also other feedbacks associated with the lapse rate, that is the, um, the rate of change of the temperature with height. Um, so, you know, when you climb a mountain, then it's getting colder. And um, so the, um, there is less long wave radiation or less heat emitted the higher you get. But at the surface, you have more, more heat emission. So um, uh, at the height, however, um, you also have less heat that is reflected back to the surface because you have less gases that contain the heat. And so if you heat the surface relatively more than the upper atmosphere, you have more heat and that more of the heat is also reflected back. And this is what we see at the poles at the moment that we have more heating at the surface relative to the upper atmosphere. So more of the heat um, is reflected back to the surface. This is another feedback that is stronger at the poles compared to the equator, because there we don't have this, um, that, the, that the surface is heated relatively more to the upper atmosphere. Right, it sounds really interesting, but it sounds really complicated as well. I'm glad I've got such a smart team working on it as well. Um, will we go on to the next question? How do you measure temperature fluctuations over such a massive area? Does anyone have an answer for that one? Oh, B. I could probably um, come in there. So we have very different, um, a, a different number of ways in which we measure temperature. We um, traditionally went out in ships and measured, you know, with a, a thermometer over the side of the ship. Um, and we still do that nowadays. But in addition, we've, in the last, 30, 40 years, we've really increased how we measure um, the ocean. We have satellites now up on um, in space that measure temperature all, all over the, sea, the um, Earth's surface, but including the sea surface. So we can measure sea surface temperature from the satellites. And then we now also have these new technologies that are almost autonomous um, and they collect profiles by themselves. Um, so they, uh, we have profiling floats, but we also have what we call ocean gliders. Um, and they go out and they can collect a, a profile anywhere. And we've put these up 
Um, and I know Marilena has some great slides prepared on um, some of these, so I don't know if she wants to share them in a moment, but I'd also like to share that we put sensors on animals. So um, a great example of how we collect temperature profiles on the west coast of um, Scotland is that we put temperature sensors on seals and the seals go out and they collect the temperature profiles for us. So it's a great um, advantage there. Oh, they're helping. That is so wonderful. That makes me incredibly happy. You've got no idea how wonderful it is to think about these creatures going out and helping as well. But Marilena, you do have some um, slides for us to see some of this equipment that we're using. Um, yeah, I'm happy to, to share. Um, yeah, of course. So um, I don't know if you can see it, but here yep. you can see the ships that um, so here we have, for instance, um, an instrument that's called CTD for conductivity, temperature, depth. This is measures, um, for instance, temperature and conductivity, which um, we can calculate um, from the, the salt content. So we know how much fresh water or melt water from the Arctic has entered the ocean. Or here you can see the gliders. And um, yeah, we have, we have floats. Or here you can see moorings. These are strings of instruments. They have an anchor at the bottom and a floating device at the top. Uh, so that keeps them straight. And then there is a chain with a lot of measuring instruments that measure, for instance, the ocean current, the velocities or the temperature, and again, the conductivity to get the salt content and also biological sensors. Um, yeah, so here, here you can see ice tethered profilers. These are fixed on the ice and they have, again, a chain um, that, for instance, of thermistors that measure the temperature that goes down. and a lot of satellites that that give a very good spatial cover, coverage of the ocean surface, like the surface temperature. So you do have the satellites above measuring the surface. Obviously, they can they're in space, so they can cover quite a vast area. But to get underneath, you do have all of that wonderful separate technology. So that's really interesting. It's also a big challenge because with the satellite we can only see the surface and those are, are great. They, they cover so much area and we get a lot of information at once. But um, the instruments we put in the ocean, they are all at individual single locations. And um, then it's very challenging to put them all in the ocean and then collect the data um, because the the ocean is so big, it covers over 70% of the Earth's surface. So it's really hard to get everywhere. And that really requires the collaboration of a lot of countries, a lot of nations to work together and have their observing programs. And then also public publicize the, um, uh, the data so we can work on it. And it's a, it's a really, really big challenge, but also really exciting to go out on the ocean and, and see um, how, how, yeah, how it's moving around and and the data, the data yeah. from the ocean, how it's changing with time. It sounds like a really big challenge, but also you get to get out there and get your hands dirty a little bit as well. And you get to exactly. see like real life in action, see all of this equipment working um, and then take that home and pop it into your computers as well. Like I do find that really interesting. Yeah, um, sometimes it's also frightening if we see, if we go to Greenland, for instance, and see the the glacier melting or so, but most of the time it's very exciting and very interesting. Is there any sort of, um, just as an additional question, is there any sort of citizen science where we could get involved and take any sort of readings and pop that over to yourselves? There are programs, ocean observing programs that take measurements from, for instance, from ships um, that are not research ships, but that are having regular routes and that is very practical so we can get the data and yeah there there are citizen science pro project um projects as well um yeah you there i think a, a large variety of different projects and it's um you can find them usually on on the internet just give it a quick google it sounds really exciting and i'm sure there's lots of people viewing at home that would like to get involved um is there any way that we could improve in these ocean models to get better readings so those data is, um data data sets are really important for models so models tend to capture the physics explaining how things change but you need to have a good idea of what they're like in the present day 
So one of the big things we've been recently developing are marine reanalyses, where you take a, a physical model of the ocean that captures all these processes, and then you run up for the past 30 years, but you do data assimilation. So you pull in those satellite observations and these ship observations and use it to pull the model back to truth. And that sort of gives you um, the best estimate of the current state of the ocean. Um, and we also include the, the seal data that B um, was talking about within these, um, these models. Um, and also on the forecast as well as the, um, the reanalyses. And obviously Absolutely. for climate studies, it's really, really vital to have a good data set to, to be able to verify in the models to, um, to understand what's going on. Exactly. I'm using these reanalysis that you produce very often because they are, they are gridded. So they have data points at each time and date. So each date in, in the past and each yeah. spatial location, even at points where no measurements are, are taken. And that is because the, um, we, we know from the physical laws of motion, we can create data points, even at points where no data was because we have data at other times or data near that location. And then from the physical loss of motion and we know how the fluids evolve, yeah. we can we can then fill the gaps. So it's like a puzzle. And initially we only have a few pieces, but um, we use these models to fill fill the gaps. And then we get a data set that is has data points at each at each time and each um, spatial point. And these are great to analyze. These help us a lot for, for climate studies. It makes so much more sense than doing simple interpolation because you've got model physics to do the the dynamic part of the interpolation. So <laughs> that's incredibly interesting. The more information you get, then obviously the more accurate models will be and uh, be able to predict our wonderful climate change. Um, I think we're ready for another question. <laughs> Are climate models the same? Where did it go? <laughs> Are climate models the same as weather forecast models? So I'll take that one. Um, so if you think of a weather forecast model as the sort of thing you see on the weather forecast on, on the BBC or whatever, that's an atmosphere model and that's run five days into the future. And if you wanted to do a, a forecast of the atmosphere, traditionally you'd assume the ocean doesn't change over those five days. So you'd have to tell the atmosphere, what is going on at the surface, but you just take a satellite image of the um, sea surface temperature and you wouldn't let that change over those five days. When you're starting to work on climate time scales, you can't just assume the ocean is going to be the same. Um, on a climate time scale, the ocean probably drives things much more than the atmosphere. So you have an atmosphere model that you would have a, from a weather forecast, and you'd also have an ocean model underneath, and they would talk to each other. So the wind would blow the ocean around and the ocean would transport the heat around and heat up the atmosphere in different places. And that was sort of where we were at in the, I think maybe the eighties, but ever since we've been adding more and more components to the system. So there's a sea ice model, there's a land surface scheme model, there's a river routing schemes, there's um, ocean biogeochemistry, ecosystem models, um, forest cover models, all included within these climate models. So one component can change the other component and it feeds back on each other. Um, another big difference is if you're doing a weather forecast with a forecasting model, you, the data assimilation is vital. You need to have those observations that we were talking about before to constrain the model because that's really important for the first sort of five days. Um, on a climate time scale, you can't use satellite images from 100 years into the future, obviously. Um, and it's a slightly different problem, basically. But at the very basics of it, the atmosphere component of the climate model is the same model. Um, the Met Office is one of the only places in the water world that does both systems, um, climate modeling and forecasting model, modeling using the same model. And that's great because it allows us to use, um, to test the climate model on weather forecasting timescales and vice versa. That's incredibly interesting. <laughs> Do you have anything else to add? Anyone else now? Because that I, was a wonderful would, explanation. That was incredibly it, interesting. It was. I think I would add that for the climate projections, we also have to make assumptions about how we will impact the 
climate going forward. So when you look at some of these internet, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Changes reports, so the IPCC reports, then you you have you see different scenarios, and the different scenarios are basically how we're going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions or not. Um, as may be the case for one of them, the highest one. Um, yeah. So, so it's interesting to, you know, we have to make assumptions about the human dimension and the action we're going to take. Right. So essentially, one is just measuring how accurate it can be, and the other one is how we can manipulate the measurements and how we can use the information that we have and how it would how it would change. That's really interesting. Right. We'll get another question going. If, oh, now, this is a really interesting question. I added this question because it was a couple of years ago, um, a very young gentleman um, came up to me after a show. I'm one of the uh, planetarium presenters here at Glasgow Science Centre uh, during the day. And uh, a young gentleman came up to me about eight years old and asked me this very question. Now, I had no idea at the time. I thought, oh, maybe, I doubt it. But I don't know. So I went to Google and the only information I could find was conspiracy theories and I couldn't find anything definitive. So I had absolutely no idea. And then few years later, and I've got an entire panel of scientists that are experts in this very thing to answer this question. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that somehow this young chap is watching this live stream right now. Um, and if you can answer this question that follows, if the ice caps were to completely melt, would the ocean rise up and cover all of the land? So I, I'll take that one, or I can take that one. Uh, no. Um, Whoa! I think there's, um, <laughs> I'm disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's about, I forget, but, but about seven metres of sea level, um, global sea level locked up within the Greenland ice sheet. Um, and then the oh, we're freezing across the board. No, it's such a crucial question. <laughs> About seven, maybe. Um, oh, well. oh, we're back. But Jonathan, if the, lost the you ice, there for a second. can you hear me? We can hear you now. We lost you there for a second, and I was just shocked. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so we had um, Greenland hold um, seven meters. It's something like the um, the, east, the large part of Antarctica has sixty three meters, and then the smaller part has seven and Greenland five or five and seven. I get those two mixed up around the wrong way. Um, but the other thing to note is that if, for example, Greenland melted and that all that, those meters of sea level went into the ocean. It wouldn't distribute evenly around the world because Greenland is like three kilometers thick, say, it's got so much mass that it attracts the water towards it. So the mean sea level around Greenland is higher than it is in the rest of the world. So if that melts, the sea level would fall in the immediate vicinity of um, Greenland and rise further around the other side of the world. So for every meter of sea level loss, or every centimetre of sea level loss from Greenland, you would expect the sea level to drop around Greenland and about a 1.3 times increase the other side of the world. And we seem to think that the UK is on about the zero line, depending on which model we look at, suggesting that loss of ice from Greenland wouldn't affect our sea level so much. But on the other hand, with the other side of the world from, ice, uh, from Antarctica, so any um, ice loss in Antarctica would have a much greater effect here than um, on average. Can I add something? Yes, of course, Madalena, add more. So if the entire ice sheets are going to melt, it will also be warmer overall, a warmer climate. And that means that the water expands. There is it's yeah. called thermal yeah. expansion, and that also contributes to the rise of sea level. And at the moment, it contributes about 42% of the sea level rise we are already seeing. So this is another factor that, that adds to, to the melting ice caps. Yeah. Right. So the more that it does melt and the more those um, sea ice rises level, those levels rise, then the more that makes the ice melt even more. So it's again, it's just that sort of feedback loop. 
Right. It's very interesting. I don't know why initially I was very disappointed that all of the land <laughs> wasn't going to be covered. I should be relieved. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much and for answering all that the question. Coastal, all the coastal cities will be covered. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> All the coastal cities will be covered, but let's hope it doesn't come to that. Um, <laughs> that's what we're working toward, at least. <laughs> we'll move on to our next question. That's made me so happy, that last question. Thank you so much for that. Um, so the next question is, how do these changes affect local areas of wildlife and communities of people? That's a really good question. Who would like to take that one? Oh, there's B. Thank you, B. Um, I can try, I can make a start. I see Marilyn also put her hand in. Um, I So uh, wildlife and communities are really being um, affected by things like the rising sea levels. So obviously there's a lot of coastal infrastructure that is at risk. Um, and recently there's been a research project um, led by Nature Scott that's looking at how much um, sea level rise would impact our coastal infrastructure and which management measures we can take including nature-based solutions or where we use nature to protect us from coastal flooding um, and that's called Dynamic Coast 2 so if people are interested they should maybe um, search that um, and um, Climate change is having an impact on the marine environment quite widely. We're seeing um, changes in the distribution of fish. Uh, we're seeing loss of habitat. We're having, um, so, so climate change is definitely having a significant impact. And that also means that it's having an impact on the people and the communities. And in the Arctic, especially the indigenous communities are being very um, severely impacted by the increased heat um, uptake that the Arctic has seen. So global warming is definitely impacting their communities more than maybe our communities currently. Yeah, definitely. We do see um, a lot of images as well from lots of wildlife heartbreaking images from the Arctic and how devastating the effects of climate change can be um, and also with the communities there as well and how it's a complete way of life is being destroyed and disturbed. Um, but Marilena, did you have something to add there as well? I think we gave a great introduction already but yeah maybe one thing about yeah it changes not only the um the communities also change the culture and the lifestyle for instance um the the indigenous people in, in greenland they um they used to be hunters and live off hunting and now they can grow vegetables so they become farmers and um yeah I'm, but there are also other changes in other parts of the country of the world where people cannot adapt and change not cannot change their lifestyle because some parts will become inhabitable uninhabitable i mean and um because they're too dry droughts and um too too many extremes that are not consistent not the human body cannot sustain these extremes and other parts of the world are changing for instance the ocean becomes more acidic or the um the the ph value of the ocean decreases it's not acidic but it becomes more acidic and that means that the coral reefs are dissolving because they are uh, um the the shells are, are dissolving in the water and um that's another ecosystem that that is destroyed basically and a lot of animals depend on this ecosystem and so it's really affecting not just the poles, but the oceans, the continents. Um, yeah, it it affects. It's it's really a change that affects. I think everything. Yeah, on every single level, um, yeah. it does affect everything. It affects lifestyle. Um, it affects culture, as you said, how people are living. Um, wildlife, um, even the pH level. I have heard that the um, sea turtles indigenous to here in Scotland, that their shells are being affected um, and dissolved almost. Um, Jonathan, did you have something to add there? I was going to say, um, if you're interested in this sort of thing for the UK, there's the Marine Climate Change Impact Partnership, which produces sort of um, every two years sort of an overview of a whole range of impacts um, sort of summarized into sort of bullet point, bullet point form and then with backing papers that appear reviewed behind it, which is a really nice source of information. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you should look into um, all of these wonderful, and there's even more um, citizen science that you can do. We did another panel about it earlier in the week. Um, we could possibly even find that information um, and pop it in our comment section for people that want to um, know more about that. There are a lot of things that you can do at home um, to help marine wildlife um, with the impacts of climate change. So there is a lot that we can we can help with as well. So we'll move on to the very next question. Let's see. Oh, this is a good one. Um, if you could wave a magic wand, what change do you think would make the biggest positive impact to the warming of the Arctic? Who wants to <laughs> who wants to go first? It looks Depends like you all want to answer this, but I don't <laughs> think you'll, you'll like the answer. <laughs> How big first? a wand do we have? <laughs> oh, the biggest wand, you can change anything. If you could just wave a magic wand, what do you think would have the biggest positive impact? Get rid have of the less warming. Carbon, have less carbon dioxide in the air. I would say. Less carbon would, dioxide in the air. Would would protect, not just the Arctic, it would do everything because now we can think of measures that um, are adaptive measures or mitigation measures that um, reduce some of the influences of climate change, like the effect of extreme events or ocean acidification or other things. But by having less carbon dioxide in the air, we can do everything at once. So that would be the best. Yeah, because it has doubled, um, hasn't it, over the past 100 years? Because it used to be, what, 200 parts per million, and now it's something on average, um, like 400 and, what is it, 400 and something parts per million on mm. average? <laughs> is that correct? Am I just making that up? <laughs> no, I, I think it's around 440, um, 440. I want to say. Yeah, yeah. Parts Maybe. per million, which has um, increased vastly. Yes, yeah. definitely. And I think, um, you know, if we really had a massive magic wand, you would maybe, you know, dye the sea white or color color all the earth white to reflect all the, you know, um, energy back into space. But we don't. And it's um, a serious um, more messing with the um, environment that we don't want to do. So like Jonathan and yeah. Marilena said, yeah. stopping our greenhouse gas emissions is the biggest um, change have, having a meeting in a couple of weeks to um, with global world leaders yes. would, would be the way to do it. I think so too. We've got a lot of high <laughs> hopes for this uh, big meeting that's going to be taking place. Um, I mean, because the reduction of that carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, I mean, the cause of it is us, it's humans, we are the ones, we are the biggest factor and it, um, our temperatures are rising faster than ever before. So I think the big magic wand um, is a reality. We are the ones that are in control. So hopefully um, the mm -hmm. big bosses can, can help us along the way. But we'll hear more about that later on, I suppose. We'll all wait with bated breath. The next question is, is there a threat that the melting Arctic ice will disrupt the Gulf Stream. Marilena? Um, so it's important to know that in the ocean, there are different types of currents. There are those that are driven by the winds and those that are driven by density gradients. And um, in the North Atlantic, where we have the Gulf Stream, we have the subtropical gyre and we have a subpolar gyre. And those gyres are, are wind driven. So we have, um, they are not, they are not, not sensitive to changes in the density. And the Gulf Stream itself is a part of the subtropical gyre. So it's the wind-driven current. And it, the Gulf Stream itself is not directly affected by, by the melting ice. However, the connection between the, or the extension of the Gulf Stream, the North Atlantic current then, um, that links the subtropics with the subpolar gyre, that is very that is fluctuating and that is driven by various things not just the winds but also by density gradients and um by yeah if we have more fresh water then this leads to a change in the density the water doesn't sink and this this has also in implications for this north atlantic current but it's it's influenced by different things so it's really difficult to to make um predictions about this current and um 
yeah but but the gulf stream itself is not affected by it or not directly affected by it so this really just exists because we have a rotate rotating earth and we have continental boundaries and um that that leads to the the formation of the gas stream so the gas stream is is not in danger yeah, well that's good news jonathan do you have something to add this um linking these processes together there's something called the atlantic meridional overturning circulation which is a net um, um, northward flow of heat at the surface um, sinking in the poles and then uh, southward return um, and this i think was what the day after tomorrow movie was about that this stopped and the world went very cold sort of thing um, I've got the, the latest um, IPCC AR5 um, uh, report here, and they say that there's a, a low confidence, sorry, um, there's a medium confidence that this will not collapse before 2100. But if it was to collapse, it would have very likely cause abrupt shifts in regional weather patterns and water cycles, um, such as a southward trend, su southward shift in tropical rain bouts, weakening of monsoons and strengthening of and drying of Europe, basically. Um, one of the, the work we're going to be doing in the Met Office and my team is to look at how this would impact sea level over the next sort of couple of years. Um, one of the things the UK, the Met Office does is runs the UK climate projections, which is sort of government led um, scenarios for the UK. Um, and it's probably getting a bit too technical to talk about that, but in one of the ensembles um, that was run by the model, there was some of the ensemble members had um, some of the slowdown of the AMOC. So we're going to be looking at downscaling that for the UK and seeing how that will affect sea level and other impacts around the UK. Probably too much detail for you. <laughs> it sounds really complicated, but incredibly interesting at the same time. Yeah. I do find myself going, that's really interesting. That's really interesting <laughs> because it's just a lot of information, but it genuinely is incredibly interesting. Yeah. Um, I can see Marilena has brought up um, this wonderful slide here. What are we looking at, Marilena? Yeah, so here is the Gulf Stream. Here you can see the subtropical gyre I was talking about, and here is the subpolar gyre. And the Gulf Stream is a part of, still part of the subtropical gyre. And this is the North Atlantic current that links the sub, subpolar gyre, which is cyclonic gyre, with the Gulf with the subtropical gyre, which is a, with an, with, which is an anti-cyclonic gyre. And yeah, many scientists are worried that this North Atlantic current will not go northward but it will just turn back or um yeah that we have a stronger separation between the subtropical and the subpolar gyre and um that would lead to a cooling of the subpolar region however it's also important to note that currently the cold anomalies we see in this region they are around um in extreme years they are around one degree or so and that is smaller than the warming that we have over europe so scientists think that we have then the west winds here that carry the temperature anomaly over the continent um but the influence of this is not not so strong however what is a big danger is what and what we, we also can see is that when we have a lot of fresh water and we get this cold anomaly we get very sharp temperature fronts in the ocean um actually one can see that here in an example. Um, so when we have when we have fresh water, this is actually a real observation that we took from a ship in the ocean. So this is the subpolar North Atlantic here, and here we had mooring observations. So these are the instruments that are on a chain in the in the water column, and then they measure the salt content. And here you can see a time series of a string of instruments that was sitting here. So here's the depth, and this is the a seasonal evolution. And so in July, we had a lot of fresh water. And um, so this is a blue means that we have more fresh water or less salt because this is in, in salt of grams of salt per kilograms of fresh water. So if we have blue means that we have less salt or more fresh water and already very small changes in the salt content lead to, uh, lead to these fresh layers that prevent mixing. And by, um, by having this fresher surface layer and th that's not being able to mix down, we can create um, cold anomalies because in winter, the air is always colder than the ocean in this region. We have warm ocean currents, remember? So, and if we have, um, if we have a, a thin layer of fresh water that will adjust faster to the, to the lower air temperature in winter. Imagine you have a pot of water, 
pot of warm water that you put outside to cool. Then it will cool faster if you just have a thin layer than if you would have a deep volume of well mixed water. So if we have a thin layer of fresh water that will cool and it will create this cold anomaly. And by doing that, it will also lead to sharp temperature fronts that you can see here. So this is the Gulf Stream. And um, this, uh, if we have more fresh water, we have colder water in, in the north because we have more fresh water in the north than we have in the south. And by creating these temperature fronts, um, we, we get more storms because this is the energy source for, for storms in the atmosphere. And here you can, this is just an example where we had a temperature front and then we had sharp winds uh, across that sharp front, strong winds. And um, this particular storm was associated with really strong um, extremes uh, over the surrounding continents. So we had air temperatures of minus 20 degrees centigrade over the US, then above warming, uh, above freezing air temperatures over the North Pole, a lot of flooding events over the UK because that was in the direction of the strong winds. So it was really unpleasant on all sides of the North Atlantic. And these really strong temperature changes are are different than if we would just have mean westerlies carrying the temperature anomaly over the continent. So it's not by just being a little colder that the ocean influences our weather, but by, by um, changing the dynamics of the atmosphere and creating changes in, in the storm patterns. And um, then this can really easily lead to 10 degree or 20 degree temperature changes compared to what is normal. Um, wow. and, uh, this is this is a different different effect, and it also influences um, yeah our weather patterns even in, in summer. So it's um it's incredibly fascinating how everything with our with our climate, with our atmosphere, with the ocean, um, the temperature, how intricately everything is all linked, and how one thing can affect another and knock on effect. Um, so what we'll do is we'll have one more question and then unfortunately we're going to have to end it there. I could talk to you all night. I'm really enjoying this. So I'm, um, I'm hoping to be able to speak to you all again very soon. Um, we're going to leave with one last question. We've touched on it a little bit already. Uh, what do you hope COP26 can achieve? B, if you want to start us off. Uh, yeah, I can I can make a start. I really hope it achieves um, action. It re I think a key focus is ensuring that money is going in. And I know with um, the pandemic, a lot of discussion has been focused around making sure we have e economic recovery after the pandemic. But I really hope that the finance that's put in really also enables climate action and drives forward that change that we're going to need in the coming really in the coming 10 years we need to make some really big changes to how we live our lives um, and I really hope that we can do that um, and that world leaders really enable us to do that and and inspire us to do that absolutely any other answers from our panel or does that really say it all I think that was a perfect answer me too I agree <laughs> I agree. Well, thank you so much to our panel. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for Hannah for that beautiful video that started us off as well. Thank you to the team at Blue Action. Thank you for all of your um, input and really hard work, um, continuing work as well. Thank you to everyone at the Glasgow Science Centre, all the team at Curious About as well. Um, thanks everyone joining us in our comment section and YouTube as well. If you want to give us any feedback, we do have a link in our comment section. If you could check that out and let us know how you think we got on. Um, and thanks again to our panel. Thank you so much for joining us and good night to everyone. You're welcome. You. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night.